Welcome to Night Light. Step away from the mainstream and gather around as we enlighten the world and our realities and travel this cosmic journey we call life. Join us as we share with you and provide that beacon that can guide us all to a better way. Explore with us as we examine a metaphysical montage of spiritual insights covering everything from the mundane to the magical, UFOs to unicorns, and everything in between. This is a time of awakening, of sharing and evolving, of spreading our wings and soaring on the cosmic breath of creation. Come and join with other light-minded spirits as we weave our lights together to seek understanding, enlightenment, and with a little luck, some wisdom. This is Night Light, a reminder that you are never alone. Welcome everyone to another episode of Night Light. I hope everyone enjoyed the uh, three-day weekend. Um, last week we uh, promoted Jackie and Bill Kusilis's, uh Bridging the Tragedy, the Mothman Festival, and Museum. Uh, you know the listeners uh, seem to really enjoy that one on uh, in the. Uh, cryptid other cryptid shows we've done and we have more in the works uh tonight we'll be delving into another audience favorite uh visitors to america long before columbus uh you can hear all three of tonight's guests at the aaps conference in october uh, Judy Johnson is a return guest, and she is the producer. You can view the AAPS website at aapscopper.com. Jill Baker will be presenting on America's Prehistoric Horses. You can learn more about Jill, her artwork, and writings at jillbaker.com. Jay Stewart Wakefield is the author of several books on transatlantic crossings, uh, Rocks and Rows, How the Sun God Reached America, and The Copper Trade. Uh, all three books can be found on Amazon and at Ancient American uh, Magazine's uh, books, uh, yeah, bookstore. Uh, that website is ancientamerican.com uh, you can order from there keep Wayne busy um, so I just want to welcome Judy, Jill and Jay the three J's <laughs> how's everyone doing tonight pretty good thank you good Mark yeah. good to be here oh you, yeah you know, uh you know, uh, I'm glad we're uh, able to pull this off with uh, three guests and Barbara and me. So we have five people on this show. So, um, you know, the, the, the uh, stars lined up for us for once. Um, so let's start off with uh, Judy. You're the mastermind behind AAPS. So uh, when and where is your conference? Conference <clears throat> this year is our 17th annual. It's October 7, 8, and 9th at the Island Resort and Convention Center. It's also a casino, but that's not part of us. In Harris, Michigan, which is 15 miles west of Escanaba on US 2 and Michigan's Upper Peninsula. Okay. 
Um, what is the website for people to um, check out you know, all the speakers? On the, yeah. yeah. Yeah, the, the updated schedule, which keeps changing as months go by, uh, but I've recently updated it at AAPS, that's Apple, Apple, uh, Peter, Sam, then the word copper, AAPScopper.com. And it'll be right there as one of the headliners, and you could just click on the place that takes us to registration. There's also meal packages uh, but the uh, whole schedule is there for you to see and a very brief description of their programs. We have 14 speakers throughout all of Friday from, let's see, when do we start programming? 10 o'clock mm-hmm. until uh, maybe 10.30. And then uh, Saturday... 9 o'clock until about 10. And then Sunday we close with our good friends, uh, Ojibwa cousins, uh, Bruce Hardwick and Dwayne Kennard, who are world travelers and have carried the living fire of the Ojibwa people, no, yes, the Ojibwa, to the world. So they'll be sharing some pretty interesting stories and about people that they have met. But that's our closing show. And there's a whole rest. Before that, if you, how much do you want me to go into? <laughs> okay, what? Well, well uh, you know, we have what? Um, you know, uh, now we're starting to get into uh, math on Nightlight, and that's not really in- encouraged. But uh, you know, what? There's three of the fourteen speakers are here on. Yeah, the show tonight. So I think the audience would get a uh, good taste of the variety of um, topics that will be discussed. The, um, mm-hmm. But, you know, if, if people um, are interested in, you know, if they you know, just say they drive to uh, Harris, Michigan, um, and you know they want to uh, just take a little break after lunch. Uh, what are some uh, places in the area that uh, people can go to get more of a feel of um, you know, Michigan's ancient copper mining and well, uh, not, other pre- <clears throat> not in that sites? area. You'd have to head up to the Keweenaw. Okay. How far is that the away? The Keweenaw Peninsula. Mm, how far from there? 90 miles maybe? A couple hours. Okay. Yeah. yeah, a couple hours. The Keweenaw is part of the ancient uh, copper range, and it's the, the mm. Keweenaw or uh, Antonagon range. And it was created millions and millions of years ago when this earth was formed and tectonic plates were pushing land masses up and gases forming and somehow a magical thing happened and made those gases turn into pure copper as they cooled and they were in those mountains. Then the glaciers came and went and came and went and grinding down those high mountains and picking up copper and dragging it down as far as... uh, northern Illinois, and uh, dragging it back. So this is why float copper, they called it float because it seemingly just floated there, but the glaciers picked them up and dropped them off. And a lot of, I mean, how many millions of tons would there have been just lying on the surface that the ancients could have picked up? And you wonder, how do we know that ancients were here and picking up copper is a lot of what our conference is about, and this is part of the research that Jay has been a big part. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's uh, maybe it's the time to jump in. This AAPF was formed by AAPS by from a fellow named Fred Ridholm, who was called Mister Copper, 
who was the mayor of Marquette many times and a history teacher in high school there. And uh, <clears throat> a very interesting guy and a mentor to most of us. And he, he was a wonderful guy that started this this group. And the group has been very productive for a lot of researchers for now 17 years. The uh, What happened in Michigan was a very unusual geologic event, a very um, early lava flow over the Great Lakes area you know, a billion years ago. Um, was uh, um, a line in the, in the area, and water permeated through, percolated through the lava and deposited copper one atom at a time into the uh, interstices in of the of the lava bed. So there's a very enormous uh, lo- uh, copper deposit with some silver in it under Lake Superior, and it was excess where. Uh, the lava bed was accessible, which is uh, uh, Isle Royal and the Keweenaw Peninsula. So the early uh, electrifying of America was from mines in the 1800s that were um, that mined copper on top of the ancient copper mines that were uh, found in, in these areas. Uh, it's a remarkable deposit on the earth, and uh, so what's 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 happened is that. Uh, Fred Ridholm, who was Mr. Copper, got us all excited because he made it clear that uh, these 10,000 pits, copper pits, were nobody knew where the copper, the copper was clearly pulled out of these these pits uh, that are about 30, 40 feet deep in the in the in the Bronze Age, which is about 5,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 years ago, but nobody knows where it went, and then. Europe had a Bronze Age, and they had no idea where the copper came from. And we've just been connecting the two. And so it's an ocean sailing story and a and a cultural mm-hmm. story of what happened in the Bronze Age. Yep. And what you're uh, talking about there, Lee, uh, uh, Jay, is that, that roots needed to be there so that the copper could be transported. Well, there were no highways, of course, but the highways were the rivers and the waterways. And so part of our discovery is finding where ancient waterways were, and those can be found by topo map, topographic maps and Google Earth. And one of our speakers is talking about that, a different route between Lake Superior and Lake Michigan. So we know three now different ways that people could have taken the copper by canoe uh, b- between the two lakes. In fact, there's a, there's a perfect lip of a big ship because in the Bronze Age, the sea levels were 60 feet higher, and uh, large ships were able to come up the Mississippi and and uh, sail around the Great Lakes and down the uh, Chicago River without into the Mississippi without any rapids. So mm-hmm. the Nipissing period uh, with the deeper water was, we know, uh, made the copper available to uh, international shipping. Um, we have a petroglyph of one uh, that's car- carved at Copper Harbor. And if if anybody wants to drive this area and look at the mines, you go up onto the um, Keweenaw Peninsula, and there's a, several mines that are open. There's a national park uh, that consists of half a dozen mines. You can go into some of them, take tours, and you can go up to Copper Harbor. It's just a beautiful thing to do in the fall. Doug, let me insert Sure. The conference is in October, and we, Lee, this is Jill, but Lee and I drive up every October to this conference, and on the way we see the leaves turning, and it is a spectacular drive anywhere from around um, Harris, Michigan. The leaves are turning at that time, and it's just a gorgeous time of year to be uh, taking a road trip. It is. We have a beautiful, beautiful country here. Yes. Okay. Well, um, let's cover, uh, you know, I think we got uh, the listeners' uh, attention with all the copper stuff. Uh, uh, 
I don't want to uh, forget about Jill's interesting mm-hmm. uh, uh, presentations. So, you know, let's spend a little bit of time uh, learning about the prehistoric horses, and we can come back to uh, all all this uh, transatlantic crossings, the north and south route across uh, the Atlantic, and going back. But uh, it, Jill, let, let's look at these. Um, your interest in prehistoric horses. Um, okay. You are looking at the west okay. coast uh, of America, well, in, in, uh, in mm-hmm. the western portion of Canada, as a route. For the horses um, coming to America, um, mm-hmm. so where are they originating, and you know, where well, where do we find the evidence of America's prehistoric horses? Well, um, just uh, in the last five years or so, there's been a big um, change in attitude about prehistoric horses. Um, I'm saying prehistoric. I mean pre-Columbian horses. Okay. Now, prehistoric horses have always been, um, ex- it's been accepted that we had here in North America very small animals that were uh, related to the horse or the pre- ancestor of the horse that didn't have hoofs, they had toes, um, and they were about as small as a dog. Um, so that is all has always been accepted. But as far as full-size horses that men can ride, uh, there's been a lot of controversy up until the last five years when the indigenous Americans started uh, <clears throat> making their voices heard. And I think this has happened in many areas, but in the area of, of horses, they've be- begun to kind of uh, like give some pushback on the idea that the Spanish brought the horses to North America. Um, the, and part of the pushback comes from the idea that, that Europeans like to take claim of, um, for many benefits that are present here in the, in the North American continent. And the American Indians have, they claim they've always had horses, and many of the tribes have, um, like the spirit, uh, the horse spirit, and uh, stories of the horse in their legends. And um, they have petroglyphs. Uh, there are many petroglyphs, which I'm going to, uh, uh-huh. not many, I'd say about 10 petroglyphs of men riding horses. Um, sprinkled around through the continent, and I'm going to show those um, in my presentation. And there are several um, doctoral theses that have been done on on where the horses came from. And a lot of them, of course, like you said, Mark, they come across um, into Canada and uh, into Alaska, what is now Alaska and Canada, across the Siberian um, um, straight there, um, the the um, um, I forget what they call it now, the land bridge, the Bering Strait from Russia, Bering Strait, yes, uh, the land bridge from Russia over to the North American continent, which was uh, you know pretty solid at one time, and the Siberia has always had these ponies, which the Mongols ro- rode. Um, And um, the DNA of the American Mustang, which is a small, tough little horse, has been traced back to Siberia. So either they came across the Bering Straits on the land bridge, or they were brought across. Now, um, there has been controversy about how men came across from Russia into North America, but a lot of people have begun to realize that boats were not um, (laughs) 
something that people shunned. If you could see some land and you had a boat, probably you took your boat over to that land. And there is a place, even today, in the Bering Sea, where you can see Russia from Alaska. And, of course, there were always people who would go back and forth. And not only that, but they found evidence of footprints on islands outside of uh, North America, um, in the um, upper northwest, uh, footprints that are fossilized into stone of um, of humans, uh, adults mm-hmm. and children, which meant that there were people here. And, of course, if there were people, they came on boats. This was on an island. And if they had boats, they brought their produce, and they brought their animals, and probably they brought their horses because their horses were necessary, not just as draft animals, but as uh, transportation. And if you ever had a horse, and I'm a horse person, if you ever had a horse, walking is just no fun. (laughs) If you can ride, you'll ride because it's so much faster and so much more fun. So probably horses came over along with men. Now, there are also other sources, and um, I have it straight from Laura Nicholas's uh, mouth that the Chinese brought horses over in, uh, gosh, 1433 or something like that. Uh, I don't have the date with me right now, but the Chinese came over in ships. Lots of Chinese came over. and. Uh brought their horses. There's other arguments, too, against just the Spanish um, introducing horses. You can look at the horses in the Northwest and know that they're not Spanish riding horses. They're Mm -hmm. small and scrubby and tough, and they have spots on them. Spanish riding horses were all one color. You know, they were brown or black or white or palomino or something. And they didn't have pinto spots. They didn't have Appaloosa spots. But by golly, look at the Siberian ponies, and they had spots on them. And you look at the horses running in the wild, and they have spots as well as being full color. So there's been a real mixture since the 1700s when the Spanish brought their horses over. Uh, Joe, has anybody done any... DNA testing on the lines, the family lines, or the genetics of these horses and their source, where they came from? Yes. Like I said, they, the DNA of the horses, the Northwest uh, ponies, are related to the Siberian ponies. Mm-hmm. They have the Siberian DNA in them. Okay. It's Jill... So when you're talking about the Northwest uh, ponies, it, mm-hmm. I, uh, you know, we're, we're kind of looking at something like the Shetland pony size versus, uh, you know, like you know the Clydesdales. Or is it, is, oh, absolutely! You know, yeah, you know, but it, it was they a big difference. Yes, there is a difference. Um, Now, they don't look like Shetlands. Shetlands come from, I believe, Ireland or something. Mm -hmm. But um, these ponies, you might say they're ponies. They're actually a small horse. And lots of them have curly hair. Uh, A lot of them have uh, long manes that go to the ground. I mean, the manes do, not just the tails. They have uh, very odd features that no European horse has. You know, they're just, they just don't look at all like, like it. They're small horses. They're very tough and scrubby, and they survive in almost any environment. You know, up north, it's very cold. And in the winter, the horses dig down under the snow. I mean, their hoofs are made perfectly for this. They can cut through the ice and the snow and find grass underneath or other other living uh, plants and stuff that they can eat. So these horses can survive. They're tough little things, 
and uh, they're not um, wild that you couldn't take them and train them, you know, and actually ride them. They're pretty nice little beings, you know. You Now, you, you're going to get some horses that are wild and just untamable, but not these ponies. These ponies are um, pretty pretty easily tamed and easily ridden. But the American Indians, uh, the indigenous people, I should say, of North America, both in Canada and down in the United States, um, as well as in Alaska, have ridden these horses for centuries. And the American Indians certainly adopted them and used them as war horses, as draft horses. Um, they they used them for milk. I mean, a horse is a very valuable creature if you can tame it. You know, I, I, I can contribute something here. We have a researcher okay. in our group that you'll hear, it, that you can meet at AAPS meeting, um, named Lon Krieger. And uh, mm-hmm. he is writing a book about the farm beds in uh, the Great Lakes states, you know, Michigan and, and Minnesota, and yep. Minnesota. And and he he has he's documenting the size of the ancient farm beds. Uh, you know, there were a lot of mar- miners to feed thousands of people. The farm beds are super- astonishingly big, big. And uh, he claims they couldn't have done it without a horse. So mm-hmm. wow. um, he, he's he's also researching the horse, and uh, it will be in his book. I'm supposed to be editing his uh, his farm um, farm bed book once he gets it further along. Um, but at any rate, so this subject is being worked on by several people. Now Jill is a very skilled artist. Graphic, um, and is helping with dioramas on a, a museum exhibit we're developing on the uh, Michigan copper trade, which we hope to to uh, make it put, put up as an exhibit somewhere while you know while some of us are still alive. So it's kind of a race against time for some of us, but uh, you, you know we're working on these things. Now as a group, we've made a lot of discoveries about the copper trade. Uh, there are a number of harbors around the Great Lakes that were uh, used when the water levels were higher um, around the uh, um, <clears throat> on the uh, near the Keweenaw at the uh, uh, um, uh, the private club has a harbor on it there, and uh, the uh, Copper and uh, Beaver Island has uh, which has newly discovered harbor on it and. Uh, the ship Patrick lives. There's a lighthouse been found at Chandelier Island down off of the mouth of the Mississippi. There were just a lots of fleets of boats involved in this, and we found digital records that we can read and so on. There's just a lot of discoveries we've been making that we can't cover in a half hour discussion on the radio. But I can tell you that our group has discovered a lot of things and we're building a case now. There are problems that we've had. One of them is that archaeologists don't generally go sailing. Most of them are not mariners, and that's been quite a problem. I have mm-hmm. found several sailor, several that actually have been involved with a lot of sailing, and they are very doing a lot of good work. But most of them are not don't understand sailing well enough. But the, the major difficulty that we've had is the time depth. People just don't get it. It's very hard. It's simple to say, but hard to understand. The United States, you know, started with colonies for about 200 years, and it's been a, a republic for the last 200, so 400 years or so. But we're talking this copper trade. We're talking uh, ships from overseas and around the world uh, visiting North America 4,000 years ago. That's 10 times as long as the United States and the colonies they put together. The depth of time is difficult to comprehend. That In fact, all these shopping centers we've built from coast to coast, all those big cities that have been built in the United States, all the airports, all these things, 
are very recent compared to the thousands of years that people were tracing all over North America. That docu- we're, we're able to document this stuff, and it's very hard to get wrap your head, head around the depth of time to which people from around the world were tracing around North America. And we can document this. It's just going to take some time to do it. Now, one of the another problem is that professionals uh, are that are that we have trouble with are archaeologists, and archaeology is is a social science. It's located in universities under um, in in the social science department, not as a real hard science. Okay, so. The, the, what is correct in archaeology depends on the opinion of the department chairman. Um, and in many cases, those sort of people have made uh, decisions and, and pronouncements that are made without even having seen the evidence. It's just mm-hmm. astonishing uh, the tr- trouble we're having. Um, where we've got archaeologists who won't even look at evidence. They won't even meet with us on some issues. And um, I've been rejected from a uh, – I was going to give millions of dollars to a museum, new museum that's being built, and uh, then they hired a new archaeologist, and I've been turned away because they wouldn't put – much stones in there that were carved 4,000 years ago, they're considered to be impossible. They got so excited about a 1,700-year-old canoe, which is just <laughs> historic time. It's historic time. It's, they don't oh, understand my. the depth of time. The professionals don't understand. We've, we've published in the magazines. I've been in the magazine 35 times, published three books. I've never had an email or a request from an archaeologist to look at any of the evidence that I have presented. I have 30 bronze axes I can read, uh, the, the, um, their stories in the, digitally, and, and no one has ever called or asked or emailed me to see one of these. No, no graduate students, no professors, no nothing. So it's, we're up against a difficult time. Uh, trying to convince a profession that's a social science. It should, we'd like to make it a factual science so that facts would matter and artifacts would matter. And it's a uphill struggle for us. But I think that we're um, uh, going to be turning the corner because we've got some new discoveries coming down the road that are going to turn, I hope, going to turn this around while we're still alive, you know. I mean, if, if those of us that are doing the research work die, uh, this may die away without people under, even the stuff even being found. But we're working on it. We think we can make progress and turn this whole situation around so that um, um, the discoveries that this group has been finding over the years become recognized and uh, that, they, that this very old prehistory prehistoric history um, of North America becomes appreciated. And the public is pretty well, receptive to it, yeah. but the professions are not. Well, if they can make a museum about the Ark uh, here in Kentucky, they certainly could make a museum about uh, history that is not, you know, about the same time as the Ark was here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Somewhere else. I've, okay. I've been, yeah. Excuse me. Jay, you mentioned water levels having been maybe 50 feet higher in the Great Lakes, but there were times when it was lower than the uh, levels of today because there have been discoveries of piers yeah. and maybe pyramids, uh, other markers way in the water, and, of course, in the oceans, too. And this is what you'd mentioned, Chandelier Islands off of uh, Louisiana. And all over the Philippines, oh, wherever there's islands. Those maybe yeah. had been joined yeah. at some point, but there's structures under there. There's cities, there's civilizations. Yeah. Long, yeah. long ago, yeah. when yeah. the ocean was maybe 40, 50 feet lower. And, People and living yeah. around the Great Lakes. People living around the Great Lakes know the water goes up and down all the time. Mm. Yes. It, and it has. It has been much lower and has been much higher. 
and it's not consistent. All in, sometimes it's the North Shores because of the retro, the ice melting off. Sometimes the, it's the South Shores are different. So the different shores are, are different elevations. You can see uh, beach lines at, at different elevations around the lake. What I'm talking about was the principally was the Nipissing period, uh, which was uh, 3000 BC, uh, which has been very well documented by Jim Schertz, uh, this uh, professor at the um, uh, in uh, of surveying uh, University of Wisconsin. Has, you know, we've done a lot of work on this, and the Nipissing was a long period of high water. There are certainly low water periods and higher water periods also. It's true. Mm -hmm. well, it, oh, it, it, I just had a, a quick uh, a point to make. Um, Jill, you were talking about some of these um, uh Hoof prints have been found in um uh, uh not not hoof prints this. but human prints. Okay. Human so, so, footprints. But it it's okay, it, it it's almost like the uh uh the extreme temperatures that have exposed these uh ancient dinosaur tracks in creek beds. Mm -hmm. did, yes. did you see that? Uh, sure. and, yes, and, I, I, and also yeah, human footprints in in Utah right beside the dinosaur place. prints. So dinosaurs yes, and like man walking yeah, together. Yeah. Yeah, walking together. Okay. Well, yeah, at least walking well, on the same uh, path. <laughs> right. Not <laughs> hand in hand. <laughs> no, I don't think this. so. <laughs> but, so uh, we uh, see. And, Go ahead. Go ahead, Judy. In, in other words, in other words, they they lived around the same period, and it, it is certainly true that that humans lived at the same time as mammoths, and that's something that that I'm going to address in my book. I'm writing a book on um, ancient prehistory, actually pre prehistory, <laughs> and when di when mammoths and humans pre uh, existed side by side. And possibly were mammoths were used to lift heavy, heavy mm -hmm. stones or, or heavy objects, just like elephants are used today. Mm -hmm. it, you know what it always comes to it, at every conference, that we feel that all of the evidence is brought forward, all of the evidence of people coming from many times, from many, many places, and and they came here. The evidence is uh, sometimes they took things. They took copper. They took whatever resources were valued to them in their culture back home. Some stayed and mingled and left their, uh, you know, they became families, and others came and just left their DNA. And these markers are found in Native Americans all across the country. You might find uh, Mediterranean and Hebrew uh, markers, uh, and you can, among the East Coast, Southern East Coast Natives. You can find Chinese markers on the Northwest, and uh, you can find... Like the Macintosh stone. Yeah, yeah the Macintosh, we don't... Know. We're still trying to decipher that. And then, of course, you've got many, many Norse influences of words that are sounding the same and the same meanings across many of the northern uh, Algonquin nations that uh, there's just so much evidence that the Norse, Swedes, Norwegians, Danes, they were here long ago. And then the Mandan mm -hmm. Indians... Uh, that as a tribe they're gone now, but there's still uh, DNA evidence that they were here, and of course other artifacts. It always they, brings us to the people. Celt, Go ahead. Celtish language. Say yeah. that again, Jill. And the the, the Mandan supposedly spoke um, a Celtish Celtic, Celtic yeah. language. 
Oh, and their little boats were Celtic. What are they yes, called, they Jay? Those, those little round little boats. Boat boats. Bo- Bo- uh, yeah, Bo- Bo- yeah mm-hmm. oh, that's it. They were it, uh, just hides stretched on a on a yeah, dome of mm-hmm. And that oh, came wood, from wood. the British Isles. Yeah. Yeah. It, and so it always it, comes down to it's a small world. We have always traveled and interacted, shared, stole, <laughs> blended. <laughs> <laughs> And it's, yeah. we're all mongrels. We're we're all really part of one big family, which is we feel that at conference. We have many yeah. people of different backgrounds, different political and religious beliefs, and we all get along. The foundation mm-hmm. which Fred Reed Home set for us was lay all the pieces on the table and see how they fit. Don't throw anything away. Uh, don't disparage the speaker. You don't have to agree. If we all agreed, we'd never learn anything. So we all play nicely together. And one fellow last year, and he's not the first, he came for the first time, he and his wife, and he was just gushing at the end. He says, this is just like family. I feel so good here. Yes, I, I must say that everyone is polite to everybody else. Even if they don't agree, mm-hmm. that you don't hear anybody arguing or fighting or anything. They're all curious. Everyone is curious to find out what someone else has to say and how it might relate to what they have and what they've brought. And that's a, another of the coolest things is when we bring people together. You know, I might talk to somebody on the phone or you might, and they're interested in such and such. And you say, oh, you need to meet this person. They're studying that too. And wonderful things have come from that. Joint discoveries and um, expeditions and books written and uh, just greater discovery because people have found one another Mm -hmm. in this network, which is very valuable. Yeah, I've learned a lot by going to this for the past 17 years. But I'd encourage any listeners that find this subject to be interesting to come. There's a lot of room for, for people, subject they're interested in, and research it and present their work and uh, just help us, you know, because this, you, this is a it's a big subject. It, this is a big area of research and and in prehistory of the of the continent. And there's a lot of room for you if you're a listener that's interested. Well, we have people who have found a rock. You mentioned the Macintosh stone. That was mm-hmm. just a little rock found in the Keweenaw, and that man who found it when he was a high school kid, he had his 30 minutes of fame, if you want to call it. He was just an amateur, but his space was just as important as Michael Cremo or any of other famous people who have come to talk with our group. And we say it's a sharing not not a show, because we don't pay our speakers, which still stuns me that we get so much talent and experience there that these people are willing to come at their own expense. They don't pay registration, of course, uh, but to be able to do that because they realize they get as much as they give. Mm-hmm. Well, and we, it, have, it, it, we do have professionals that come. Absolutely. Um, I would say Scott Walter is, is a professional, and we have, um, um, you know, Jim and, uh, yeah. and lots of people, people are professional. Are professional. Yeah. yeah. They're professional at a whole lot of different things, which is useful mm-hmm. to us, actually. So if you're, if, you, if you're a listener that's got some a particular kind of a skill, whether it's uh, – uh, you know, ground radar uh, pen, uh, studies, Flying or, a drone. whatever it might be, just come and exactly. contribute. We'd we'd like to see you. Yeah, flying a drone, like it, Mark, you mentioned that. That's really important mm-hmm. these days. It, it's mm-hmm. be- becoming uh, u- ubiquitous, and uh, and I'm sure Jay is familiar with a lot of the 
drone footage uh, being taken over America's Stonehenge. Uh, you know, Dennis is probably listening now. Uh, but uh, you know, he, he sent me numerous photos of some of the uh, – what the drones are revealing and you know the alignments. Um, it, it's being used – so heavily right now in all kinds of archaeological sites. It, it's giving us a totally new perspective. Mm-hmm. The ground mm-hmm. penetrating radar is yep. uh, yep. non-invasive. LIDAR. It doesn't, yeah, and then there's LIDAR, which shows a map without the trees. But the ground mm-hmm. penetrating radar doesn't wreck anything. You just take it across and, and see a lot of things that would have had to have been dug out previously in order to uh, find them. Yeah, where post holes were, were yeah. located. In, in Kentucky, yeah. we have a group of, of really interesting people who are very curious about what's gone on in Kentucky, which is kind of central United States, um, uh, that is east central. And uh, evidently, um, there was quite a lot of activity in this area in prehistoric times. And we have a drone person that has done drone work for us over some mountaintops. And their drones have um, even encountered some kind of, of microwaves or, or magnets or something, and have, which has drained their batteries, and they just barely got their drones back. Oh. So there, there are interesting things here that we are going to try to investigate. And also, we use LIDAR and um, drones in um, England, in Wales. We actually paid somebody to go and uh, do work over what we think was King Arthur's uh, Camelot. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a place in Wales called Carmelon, and um, we paid someone to do LIDAR work, and sure enough, on a high hill, the highest point, In that part of Wales, there is a circular, like a tower, with other buildings that is showing up in the um, fields on that tall mountain, on that tall plain. Mm. So it could have been a castle. Yes, very interesting. Now, you talked about professionals or non-professionals. Some of our amateurs are professional amateurs because they've done so much travel and discovery for so many yeah. years. Lee, uh, Jay is among them, and Lee Pennington, your sweetie pie, and his wife before you. And mm-hmm. uh, and he's he's just made so many important discoveries and filmed them and has... Mm-hmm. It's always so interesting. You know, he's got a very broad knowledge, and I often refer people to him. Uh, and we do have, uh, let me see, another professional from Egypt coming this time. And we've got three people talking about pyramids, and pyramids wow. aren't just in Egypt. They're all over the world. So mm-hmm. we have mm-hmm, Maher, Maher Hagag from Egypt, and then we have David Rush of uh, Ohio, who is also talking about who built the pyramids. He's got his angle of research. And Angela Michael, who is a new speaker, both of them, David Rush and Angela Michael. Now, Angela has been researching for, gee, 30 years and using Google Earth and putting a lot of things together. And she has met with a lot of people. Have you met her yet, Jay? Uh, I don't think I've met him yet, no. No, Angela, I, Angela Michael. I like her. Yeah. So she has I'm, found I'm, pyramids. I'm helping, in... bring, I'm helping to bring Mahu because oh, he's, have... a, he's a teacher of ancient Egyptian, the reading of ancient Egyptian, and it's uh, re- relevant to the artifacts, some of the artifacts we've been finding. So we're in, trying to make in him North a, America. Trying to, mm-hmm. trying to get him to be part of our team and our uh, so that we can develop our expert depth and of expertise. Um, among uh, the, our people, you know. Sure, and we yeah. have Egyptian evidences here too, found in caves. Yeah. And look at all what the place level? names that that are Egyptian names: Cairo, 
and I can't even think of the other yeah. ones now, but there are yeah, a we number don't know of why Mem- happened, Memphis. Yeah. Yep, Memphis. Yeah. Where we there's a place in, in southern Illinois called Little Egypt. Yes. And, yeah, that's what he's. Yeah, we'd like his uh, take on a lot of this stuff. So it's going to be interesting to, to get to know him. Uh, so place that white names are important. What's that? Mm-hmm. I said place names are important, but if you know this uh, Egyptian fellow, uh, you might snag him for next year, huh, Jay? What? He's coming this year. Oh, oh, that's the one you're talking about. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I thought you I, gave I me another I'm, name. I, I heard another name. Pat. Mm-hmm. Maher, yeah. Yeah, Pat I White met him and yet. Jay are sponsoring him, bless your hearts. Yeah, well, we, need, we need his help. Well, so, Jay, Jay hmm. you, need to, you need to tell us some of the things that you're working on because um, Jay now, Jay has uh, presented and has done articles for many, many years in uh, many subjects. And in Ancient come, American uh, Magazine. In Asian yep. American Ma- Magazine, and he's done uh, studies on um, both in Europe and in uh, other other areas. So he has mm-hmm. a lot of uh, stuff, and he's working on some particular um, projects right now too. Things that I'm helping sure. him with in that I'm doing these um, large uh, tableaus, you might say, of prehistoric yeah, towns right. and and uh, copper smelting and mining uh, areas. Will you bring some pictures with you so we can see? Sure. If you want to show those, Jill, why don't you can bring pictures of them and show them. Yeah, I'll give you a table. Okay. Yeah, I think that'd be good. Um, Yeah. I've only Um, done two, but um, because they take so long. Yeah, they might be a third coming. What's that? They're extremely... I, I've only done two, but they take so long. They're extremely detailed. Are they very yeah, large, they or do you do them smaller and then going to have them projected larger on the? Uh... Yeah, we could we could have them projected larger because they're supposed to be like extremely large. Mm-hmm. And I do yeah. them at 600 DPI so that they can be. Those, enlarged. They're detailed at yeah, yeah. when they're enlarged. I'm, I'm so getting them printed. At, I'm getting them printed here in Seattle at uh, four foot by six foot to be mm-hmm. dioramas in the museum exhibit. Great. Uh, but, yeah, if you can show them, uh, just add them to your talk and show them uh, to the conference, that'd be fine. That's fine with me. They're, you know, I'm not proprietary, proprietary about them. I mean, people can use them. Great. So, okay. For other things. So, um, Yeah. But one um, thing always leads to another when we're talking about any subject and it can link to this and then that and then that. It's like finding a standing yeah. stone that seems significant. It's pointing to something. If you see one, a marker stone, it's pointing to another stone. And they mean something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, you, you get a lot of ideas coming to this conference. And um, yeah. I recommend uh, the listeners come. To the AAPS in Escanaba and uh, the Island Resort, and um, you can just get an earful of a lot of different subjects, and and you might find something that's of particular interest to you. The other thing is, you should subscribe to Ancient American if you don't get it. It's uh, yeah. You can Google ancientamerican.com or uh, Ancient American uh, is a magazine, and. Uh, you, Every one of us should be getting that. Every person that comes to conference and should be getting that magazine. They mostly, I think, they do. Yes, yeah. I think so. It was printing sixteen thousand for a while. I don't know what he's doing right now, but um, I, I certainly recommend that if the, his listeners find anything interesting in this um, brief presentation tonight, that you either come to the conference or at least. Subscribe to Ancient American Magazine for thirty-five bucks or something. You, you'll find it just fascinating. So, on we this, also uh, have an AAPS uh, page or group on Facebook, and there's a wonderful interchange of ideas there from all over the world. We have, gee whiz, our members are probably about seven thousand now, uh, mm-hmm. which is very nice. And people will. 
sometimes they'll bring things that people will say it's, it's just a rock, uh, but we have trained them not to say nasties to people who have just a rock. But they're interested and they're out there looking. And they're trying to. They see anomalies and sometimes it's natural things. Uh, and other times mm-hmm. maybe they'll find something wonderful. But there's some really great mm-hmm. sharing there. And on Facebook we have to spell out the whole name: Ancient Artifact Preservation Society. And you will get there and uh, join and see what's what's going on. And if you have something to share, you have a little find that's curious to you, show it. And uh, if you find something cool on the Internet, share that. It's been a very nice group. Judy, speaking of, uh, you know, finds uh, in a couple of the – uh, chapters that Jay has in his the the copper trade. He he talks about um, uh, the Moog collection and how they got uh, Jay interested in these axes and deciphering them. Uh, so Jay, Jay, could you tell us a little bit about Story and how it led you into uh, analyzing the dots and rows on the axe heads. Yeah, I could just, there's not much time left, but let me just say that a Dr. Mu, a physician in southern, southwest Germany, uh, collected what are called decorated axes during his lifetime. He died a long time ago. And it was found, I guess there's a museum in his neighborhood there which has some of his stuff, but they they found a box under his house that was in the mud that World War I was fought over his house and World War II was fought there. And so the, the, the provenance of some of this stuff is, you know, from a box in the mud under his house. And I was able to buy them. I've been able to buy about 30 of these decorated axes. I've been almost... I've been in most of the museums in Europe, everywhere but Berlin, and uh, I have never seen one of these in a in a museum. I have 30 of them. Uh, they they record information digitally, and I can read um, the where they sailed and where their colonies were and so on. It's a remarkable collection. I was going to give them all to the to the uh, historical society, but uh, you know, they don't want to show them, so here goes a priceless set of stuff. I'm going to put it in a museum somewhere else. But they're just remarkable. They're just... Uh, um, and what no you're one, showing, no Jay, can... what? what? What you have shown to us, whether it be on stone or bronze or an axe or uh, with these designs, they just look like pretty designs until you get somebody smart like you uh, to say that no, those aren't designs. They're telling us something. They're telling us lengths of uh, of time and space and nautical miles and islands and locations. Locations, yes. Well, yeah. People yeah, didn't uh, put remarkable. things on stones yeah. willy nilly. They meant something. It took a long time for people to be able to put what was said in the air down on paper. Language is a very recent thing. Okay, and mm-hmm. so these for thousands of years, people were crawling all over North America, and nobody. There's no digital records. There's no written records, and so historians say it's all baloney. We'll never know, and that's all wrong because we can now read on the bronze recorded in bronze. We can read uh, the latitudes of where they were sailing and so on, and you can read all these latitudes of 39 and 38. 38 numbers, 38 dots, and 39 dots. That's all about the Azores Islands. And when you go there, there's, on Mount Pico, there's uh, pyramids there on the waterfront. And there's another axe with a feather dancer drawn on it. And the, 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 the prehistory is starting to be understood a little, but not by the archaeologists yet, because none of them are called to look at any one of these 30 axes. I think they're priceless records they from are. the Bronze Age. And, I want. I'm going to do something with them. I can't just have them go to 
have my sister give them to a garage sale. I've got to exhibit them oh. somewhere. A lot yeah, of and write, bring been, a, write a book about them, Jay. I mean, just yeah, them a, bunch the, of, a bunch are of them are in them my to book. The, conference? the copper trade. Well, I brought one to the conference, and the flight attendant on the airplane said they were a weapon and almost took one away from me. <gasps> Oh, no. Oh, jeez. Yeah, you, you, I can't travel with them, but I, I was going to give the museum all them of them. in your bag. I think they're you priceless, can put them in, you know. But you academics them in bag, don't, or don't get ship it. Them. Academics them don't by? get them yet. I'm going to ship all this stuff back and build a museum. So mm-hmm. that's down the road. Okay. We're working on it. Jill and I are working on a museum, and I'm working yeah. with some other people, too. So you have not you know, talked about your presentation, Jay. For conference. Yeah. Well, I'm this at this at this conference. I'm going to talk about the end of the Bronze Age, at 1200 uh, uh, BC, and uh, what that led to, what caused it, what led to, and where it was, and it's uh, and the Olmecs that observed it and carved relics about it. So, at any rate, that's that's just a special little subject that I've been studying for years, and I just wanted to kind of get it off my plate and for people to understand what I what it's about. But, uh, the, 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 all my work on the copper trade is in the book, so I think it's I've already written down most of that. But um, it's been a very interesting experience to be involved with AAPF. I've learned a lot over the years. I've contributed a lot also, met a lot of interesting people. These people are my friends. Judy's friends uh, puts a lot of love around. It's a very rewarding thing to go to. Yeah. And and also, um, you learn a lot about prehistoric t- times and maybe even your own ancestors and, and mm-hmm. why they came over. And also... Um, I okay. I have a an article that was it was published in um, Ancient America. It was called "The Maps That Columbus Used," and it is now available on Academia.edu. It's called "The Maps That Columbus Used," but it's in two parts. The first part talks about all of the people that came to North America, uh, to the North American continent, I should say and the South American continent, too, partly, from Europe, from Asia, and from all around the world. And there were many, many civilizations. Africa was one of the big civilizations that came to South America. And they had a great influence in South America at one time. But that was a prehistoric time. And they left these huge heads, um, which were unearthed. Um, you know, in, in the last century. And they're obviously African heads. And it had to do with the climate change in Africa. Africa used to be all jungle, and then this great desert arrived, um, you know, because of the climate and became the Sahara Desert. Well, all and there used to be to... cities there. There are maps that yes. show cities. Yes. And all those people had to go somewhere. There were thousands of people, and a lot of them came to South America. Well, that's just one influx of immigrants into these two continents. And there were other other people from the Asia, from China, uh, from the Orient, from the Philippines. Um, they've recently shown that the DNA of many American Indians is Filipino, mm-hmm. which is shocking to many people, but it stands to reason. The Filipinos were great sailors yes. in their day. And they could and cross they, the sea in a in an out, what do they call it, outrigger mm-hmm. canoe? The, is that the yeah, right name for it, hole. Jay? They, yes, dull, they could travel great hole. distances, and they yes, could build them very, very big and carry a lot of gear with them, and they were very seaworthy. Absolutely. We're having a lot of problems with politics. Um, you can't get a grant yeah. to do archaeology in the Azores because the Portuguese are very uh, defensive about their possession of the Azores, and if somebody else discovered it, they worried that they might lose their possession. 
And the Spanish uh, is very, very it's the, the Spanish same thing is it's the true same here. thing. The Spanish yeah. are, produ- are, are, are producing this Columbus thing, which he was the last yeah. guy to get here. But they've been yeah. trying to justify they're taking over of Central and South America, enslaving the people, uh, which they did. Uh, they made slaves of all the locals because they get, became with the property when the property was given to conquistadors. So they enslaved the people, millions of deaths due to the Spanish. And they're trying to justify all this, that they discovered the place, which is just total baloney. The problem is yeah. the Smithsonian bought it and has been pushing it, and, um, and uh, it's been very hard for us to, to, to counter uh, archaeologists that are trained in the Smithsonian mantra that Columbus was first. Yeah, it's just been nasty. Destiny. It's been nasty. And, uh, but I think we're going to make progress because we're just getting so many pieces, so much evidence, and uh, there's just a wave that's starting to build here on this. And, well, in and the we're early turn times, it early times of yeah, archaeology with the Smithsonian and Powell and everything, that if anybody spoke or published anything about Native Americans having a written language, they would lose their careers. And so they had to keep them stupid. And it was if they're savages, then it's all right to overtake them and destroy them or do, make slaves or whatever they wanted with them. But if they were intelligent people with a written language, it's not so easy to do. So nobody could say that it was true that these people here had intelligence and skills and communication methods. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, we're finding well, now that... that uh, yeah. Judy's gotten close to some of the Indians, and so is Jim Church, who is a little bit of an Indian, I guess. And we're, Indian we're, at heart. We're getting some, we're getting some uh, knowledge from Indians that they haven't been able to tell the white people. Yeah. Yes. Well, we've been and, building and trust. this is coming out. Yeah. At our conference, what? which is lovely, we've made friends with the Potawatomi and the Ojibwa, uh, Ho-Chunk and... Uh, maybe some others that have come in, and they realize that this is a safe place. And this is what speakers for years, we've been doing this more almost 30 years, but only officially for 17, uh, actually 18 because we skipped a year of a conference, but that people can feel safe speaking what they have to say, where they have been rejected and ostracized by the professionals elsewhere, and finally they come here and they just about cry, and some have, with relief that they find people who will listen to them and not call them fools. And uh, it's happened many times. You've seen it, you kids, you, Jay and Jill. Yeah. It's, it was a lot of fun. You know, one of the Potawatomi chiefs named me Iskade Michigan. Uh, gave me an Indian uh, oh. name at the last conference. Oh, did he? And um, put me into the, the world Yeah, was that Earl Meshagod? Yeah. Well, Ken Meshagod well, um, is the chief. An the... They're calling me an educator in the Wolf Clan. <laughs> name, wow, name. That's they, wonderful. They put Wayne in the in the Bear Clan. Remember that? It was fun. Yes. That was terrific. <laughs> <laughs> so you never know quite what you're going to get at this conference, but, you know, it's always something. I've never been yeah. disappointed. Good. Yeah. Well, uh, and part of my paper is going to be um, some of the American Indians who have recently done research that has been accepted by the uh, in- intelligentsia, uh, the university uh, um, uh, you might say community, and uh, I'm going to reveal some of these people who are indigenous Americans who have done research on their own tribes and their own peoples yeah. and come up with some fabulous um, uh, stories that just totally counteract what has been said by uh, European uh, descendants. Um, and it's it's very exciting what's happening right they, now. They have been allowed to find out. I think a lot of young out. people, a lot of young people are are beginning to accept a broader view of our our history. Yes. Well, the natives for so long were stifled in their education and wanted the, the mm-hmm. Americans tried to 
just teach the Indian right out of them. And this group, our friends there, they're uh, trying to get the Indian culture, their language, their ways back to the young people. And that's only happening now, Mm -hmm. you know, after all this time. And they're finally realizing that they have much to be proud of and much to learn. And it's okay. They're not being stifled anymore. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It, it's coming around. Jill, yeah. are you finding that by looking at um, the legends and folklore that you're getting more of a truthful story? Or, or maybe the story is being yes. actually backed up by may, maybe some of the archaeological evidence, um, mm-hmm. it, 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 and like you know what what uh, was mentioned um, just a minute ago. Uh, are they revealing more uh, about them? <laughs> than what was in, uh, you know, just say the settlers' uh, journals. Absolutely. There is so much more, Mark. You you just have no idea how much more there was that was totally ignored. One of the uh, Indian women that has done a doctoral deep, uh, dissertation and is now um, has a book out um, has revealed that the all of the tribes in the North American continent actually had like packs between them and treaties between them where they used the whole continent as a system, an ecological system. Certain areas were used for game, certain areas were used for gardens, and certain areas were used for mining um, and precious metals and, and uh, Our habitation. stones and shells. And, and, yes. And, of course, the habitation areas were everywhere, and the different tribes adapted to their their uh, local environment. But she claims that the all of the American Indians um, existed peacefully, knowing that they could trade and get goods from one side of the continent to the other when they were needed, and that they could get game, food, um, precious metals, anything they needed could be found. And they had a whole system which was totally destroyed when the frontiersmen came in and started taking over these areas that had been preserved as sacred grounds. And they just started claiming the land and <clears throat> doing all kinds of things to it and just totally destroyed their, their system. Right. The natives didn't have a sense of ownership. It belonged to everyone. It, yes, and they had a, a complete so, system that that everybody knew about. But when the uh, Europeans came in, they had no idea that there was already a system in place. Mm-hmm. They just willy-nilly trampled over all of the uh, systems that were set put in place and had been existing for centuries. They could have learned so much, and some did, thank goodness. Yes. Yes, some did. But in but, the um, story is never ending. We're finding that we are more alike than we are different, and that there always have mm-hmm. been exchanges of people of all kinds from all over the world, and we yeah. like to point them to the North America, and if we could point it to our copper, that's a bonus. It doesn't always, yeah. but we learn so much. Mm-hmm. Well, another thing, Mark, that you asked about was in the legends, and the legends mm-hmm. show that the people uh, adapted to their environments, and <clears throat> the book that I'm writing, which is about um, about 12,000 B.C., um, when the world was destroyed, everyone knew about it. And and um, they went underground all over the world. 
people built tunnels under their cities. Oh, 12,000? Yes. 12,000 12, 12, 12, 12, B.C. 12, um, okay, that's way and back. And they, they went underground, and then the Younger Darius occurred because they were aware that it was coming. And mm. they built... Uh, uh, tunnels under, and now today you're finding tunnels under every major city. Um, yeah, and yeah. people are familiar with the catacombs in Rome and with right. the uh, Vietnamese tunnels, the Viet Cong tunnels, but no one knows who, who made them. Well, it was people that lived long ago. <clears throat> These were whole systems. These were whole cities that were built underground. And they're mm. finding more and more and more of them in Russia and and China and, and everywhere. But and anyway, they had been used in many civilizations yes. after those, some yes. for not many very nice know things. Carl right. well, Henke is going to be talking about the Younger Dryas events and the science of dating and the trickery that has been used to confuse uh, science. Didn't help our knowledge, but uh, so he's going to be covering some of that. Right, and the legends... Tell the American Indian legends tell that their ancestors, the ones that we hear today, their ancestors came up from underground where they've been living. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that was okay. our yeah. Adam and Eve, you might say. Yeah, 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 you hear that in the Kiva stories. Yeah. The Kivas were. Where, uh, if, if anyone is unfamiliar with what a kiva is, it's a round, um, kind of like a meeting hole, and it's kind of mm-hmm. usually covered, like underground, sort of. They build mounds on, over them, and they, um, you, it's kind of like going underground to meet, and it's a sacred, peaceful, holy place. And safe. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Uh, when uh, we, when uh, Maria Wheatley's been a guest with us, she's uh, spoken about the frog goos in the Orkney Islands that were used uh, pro- almost like a uh, sensory sensory deprivation tank. Mm-hmm. Got me on that one. Oh yeah, it's, uh, it's and you also have that passage in the Book of Revelation about uh, uh, the people who live in the earth. Ah, so, uh, wow. that's uh, yeah, kind of kind of weird. It's uh, you know, the Bible's going sci-fi on us on that passage. It's like who who are those people? Yeah, I have to look that up. <laughs> I need to mention Bob Krepke, who's uh, who has done a great deal for discovery on ancient Michigan copper. He has done three parts in a series called America's Greatest Industry. He had first wanted to call it Michigan's Greatest Industry, which is the copper mining. But he has done a, a lot of research from many sources, from naysayers as well as people like us who um, <laughs> believe differently. But she's done a fabulous job. He, we t- thought he, we might see his fourth uh, episode of this series. He's not ready for this fall yet. But there is another one coming, and it's been shown on public television. And it can be yeah, found. He was a... Go ahead, Jay. He was a filmmaker for Ford Motor Company for his whole life. So yeah. he's, he's quite experienced in, in this stuff. Uh, based, most of us are focused on Bronze Age, not going TBGB way back into the Ice Ages and before, although some people do. And there is interesting stuff in India underwater and all that. But mm-hmm. uh, we have, at AAPF, we've been sticking more to the copper story, which is a Bronze Age thing around um 3000 bc down to around 1200 at the end of the bronze age so well there were even some kind of datings in wisconsin uh 6000 years ago there yeah there's in the people copper, have got some early mining. dates on the copper here and there so i you know 
it's the question is what what's the evidence we we always want to hear the evidence you know uh, mm-hmm. what people have so yeah. <clears throat> but um, at any rate um right the, people um, aren't just giving us theories they're showing us the stuff what they have found to come to their theory we we want to see the evidence that's right yes right so, well, yeah. I, yeah. as far as the 12,000 date, um, I I have done a lot of research probably over the last 10 years. And we all know of uh, the caves. We all know of the tunnels. We all know of the, uh, uh, the, you know, ancient, like, computers and stuff that have been found underground mm-hmm. and a piece of copper with a... a uh, no, I'm sorry, not copper, but a piece of coal maybe with a gear in it, you know, mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. is shocking because it had to have been there when the copper, when the, I'm sorry, when the coal was formed, which would have been thousands of years ago. You oh, know, millions. things like that. So, yeah. Yeah, know. there's an interesting so, culture called Uparts, out of place artifacts. Yes. They're, they're fascinating. And it's hard yep. to relate them to anything because it's, the dates are I'm wild, sure. hundreds of thousands out of date, out of the, out of place on some of them, yes. and or maybe millions of years out of date. So they're yeah. they're they're maybe more alien than anything else. It's hard to know what some of these are, you know. out of place, what what the out of place artifacts are is difficult. Um, mm-hmm. So well, what we're getting well, past we, is what what I learned in grade school that came from a knuckle dragger you know caveman and got smarter mm-hmm. and, and more uh, sophisticated as hundreds of years went by but there are cultures that have come and gone they have come they have been very sophisticated and technologically uh smart and then had their civilization changed maybe maybe a catastrophe maybe a comet maybe an ice age uh and then they mm-hmm. almost start all over again and so we've been yeah. up and down, up and down. It's n- not an an yeah. easy grade from stupid to smart. Some of this stuff has been presented and discussed by speakers at the AAPS over the years. Yeah. yeah so, it, uh, uh, but it's hard to it's hard to pull it all together and make sense out of everything at once. Jay. Jay uh, one of the you know we we've been talking about some of these mysteries oh uh 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 Judy that uh biblical passage is in revelation 5 3 5 3 i will look it up yeah um uh, just for the listeners i'll read uh but there was no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth who was able to open the scroll and read it. Mhm. Mhm. Uh, so, but um Jay since we've been talking about some of these mysteries um you know we we've had uh guests like uh Lori Nicholas who um uh, Oh, and you know, it's in your book as well, where uh, people are sailing into the uh, Great Lakes, and mm-hmm. they're making their way down the Mississippi River, uh, or the Saint Lawrence. Stopping. Yeah, yeah, and you know they uh, visit uh, um, Cahokia. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Uh, there's all, all these uh, waterways are uh, very uh, instrumental in navigating uh, throughout the North American uh, continent. And uh, Jay, you're arguing that uh, there are a couple places there at the uh, where the uh, Mississippi Delta empties into the uh, Gulf of yeah. Mexico, there are a couple places that show yeah. ancient ruins. And uh, I think last year Judy had uh, 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 George uh, Gillet mm. 
uh, yes. speaking. Uh, it, it, uh, was George's George is very ill right now. He's, oh. he's not doing well. Okay, well, ho- hopefully, oh, I'm sorry hopefully to, he'll... I'm sorry to hear that. He, he have, made some fairly a... major discoveries, in, in my opinion. Yeah, he's made some yeah, it, over 50 it, years. It, it, is his uh, research supporting yours, or is he going back earlier? But uh, you know, can, can we talk a little bit about that <laughs> mystery of... Uh, the Delta and what was going on there, and, and Jay, or, tell him about the the copper processing place now, which yes. could very well yeah. link. Well, um, poverty, poverty yeah. point. First of all, yeah. first of all, <clears throat> mystery, mystery, a mystery is something going on below your level of understanding. You know, some people get in a yeah. car and they turn the key and it starts, and it's a mystery. Okay, that's just an example. So something we don't understand. So, it's something we don't understand. So what you try to do is study and learn a little more, so that you begin to understand what's going on. Now there's a Bruce Seth archaeologist. There's an archaeologist named Bruce Seth, uh, with the, in Texas, who is my age, getting on, and he uh, has an excellent report that I found when I at Poverty Point. There's a major site called Poverty Point on the Missis- that used to be on the Mississippi. Um, and uh, the, the Bruce Seth report sh- revealed that at the mouth of the Pearl River, where there's been a lot of flooding recently, um, actually it's the, the Pearl River uh, has the biggest swamp in the United States. I thought it was, the biggest was in Georgia. But, but I took a cruise on a, on a jet boat through it, which you can do when you're down there. And there's a huge swamp. And, of course, it was full of trees, and those trees could have been floated down to the mouth of the Pearl River. And at the mouth of the Pearl River, the Bruce Seth Report shows carbon deposits that are six feet deep, multiple, and two different colonies, two different villages that are different from one another, two different cultures, not Indian cultures, but from 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 the old world to when when we think Minoan and when I think Beaker, Beaker people, but at any rate, um, two which different is an cultures. area of your expertise, the Beakers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So these these people were melting copper. It's not smelting. Smelting is a process of getting copper out of you know green rocks and yellow rocks and like that. But when but you've got pure oxide, copper, you don't need to smelt it. Pure copper, you don't have to go to the high temperature and smelt it. It's just a matter of melting the copper out of the rocks from the Great Lakes. So they come down the river. Now, the river was not dammed by the Corps of Engineers like it is today. So sometimes you could paddle up the Mississippi, and sometimes it would be roaring down full of logs. But you'd watch the seasons. These people sailed up and down with copper in the bottom of their boats. And they land at this place that Jill has just painted in her diorama. And uh, they would melt with big fires and co- carbon, six feet deep in fires, and melt copper into uh, little um, uh, hollowed-out places in the, uh, in the ground and make what are called oxide ingots. These are ingots, 60 pounds, over 50 to 60 pounds, that had ears on them so they could pick up the corners, okay? And that's how the copper was shipped to, to Europe, and it was sold by the Minoans all over Europe. It, it, uh, and there are pictures in, on walls in Egypt of oxides. Yeah, yeah the oxides. Was, uh, and the pharaohs would give, you know, so many hundred as a gift to another king and so on. It was the way copper was traded around in the old world by the Minoans. And... Um, and, and in northern Europe by the Baker people. At any rate, um, the mouth of the Pearl River where, is where a lot of this happened. And it, it's a, it's a you, you take a little, swan, a little um, route up through, a little waterway up through the, through the bayos uh, to get to the site. It now has an industrial site on it. But I, I got in there with a local archaeologist who was a, an employee of NASA. Now, just up the same waterway, 
NASA has a big installation, a big uh, military installation, and barges go through there. The biggest ones are carrying uh, oxygen and hydrogen in huge containers on barges, and those go up on every every piece of everything that has been shot to, into space by the Americans has been put on a test um, put on a, a test platform there and has been tested at this site before it goes over to Canaveral and gets shot off, okay? So this little waterway, all the copper that was shipped, that was melted and shipped to Europe for the Bronze Age, went down that little waterway, and all the things shot to space have gone up and down that waterway, the same little waterway. It's quite remarkable, and nobody's ever heard of it, but it's right there at the mouth of the Pearl River. It's quite amazing. So, um, and yes, big fleets of boats came from Europe uh, over thousands of years. People don't understand. You know, you live, I've been studying this 30 years. I mean, it's a drop in the bucket. I mean, it, this happened 4,000 years ago and 3,000 years ago. And uh, many, many boats were docked on the salt domes off of Louisiana and where they were there are underwater uh, and pottery uh, being made that's now underwater, but the pottery probably was so that they had pots to put salt in because that was so such a valuable way to preserve food before refrigerators. So the people sailing to Europe were sailing off with copper and with buffalo hides and drugs and salt in uh, pot, pottery in pots and and um, pearls from the rivers in Tennessee and. Just a, it was an amazing trade across the Atlantic in the Bronze Age, and they have no written records, so the archaeologists think it didn't exist. And this <laughs> is the fight. This is what this is what we're up against. Wow, so, Jay, Jay, with the um, hieroglyphs that have the oxide. Uh, uh, Copper uh, ingots. They also show the, show the bun ingots. So men carrying the oxides and another yeah. man carrying a tray full or a basket full of bun ingots. They look like a hamburger bun. Some of them are, some of them are copper and some of them are tin when they're in yeah. thin bun form. And, these and are, how do you make you bronze? At, if, you get, if you get to Egypt, look at the... Uh, the most important thing is to go into the Valley of the Kings, of course, and see those underground tombs. But the most beautiful tomb is Hatshepsut, and the carvings are on the first floor level of Hatshepsut's tomb. You can see her ships and carvings and and, mm. copper, and the copper ingots. Yeah. Well, it's important. Why is copper and tin important is because bronze is basically 90% copper and 10% tin. So the tin mines of England and the copper from the UP, Upper Peninsula of Michigan, they came together. Yeah. Yeah. Personally, I think a lot of the tin came from South America, but archaeology yeah. in South America is, hasn't gotten very far yet. Mm. And uh, But there are uh, indications on petroglyphs that they were down in the uh, – um, uh, Rio de la Plata down in the, uh, South America and probably picking up tin there from the, the, the Andes. But there was um, you know what? Trade Rio from de la Plata England to, right? e- to Egypt and to the Hebrew nations and uh, Phoenicians, so that there was tin trade back and forth. From yeah, sure. Early, you know early what bronze. Rio de la Plata means, right? It means the river of, of silver. Ah. One, yeah. Well, that's what was up there with the whole mountain of it. Yeah. Yeah. They. It, so, it looks like silver. Tin does. Yeah. Huh. Well, you know, one of the conquistadors wrote that there was a pathway from the Silver Mountain all the way to the Atlantic coast that had all the vegetation <laughs> cleared. So it was a clear pathway right down to the ocean. Was hmm, noted wow. by, it was maintained clear 
by the natives because of the big trade going on. But, of course, wow. it, uh, when the conquistadors came, all that stuff uh, just overgrown and gone, you know. But So what was it used anyway, for, for uh, horse travel? I don't know. Trade well, to the Atlantic. It was a the trail tent. to the Atlantic. Carried, yeah, to carry the tin to the ocean, to the Atlantic. But, um, but yeah, not on a river, stone by land. In Argentina. By land. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's a lot in South America that hasn't been researched yet. There's reasons for it. But, um, yep. you know, the Baker people, the Baker people tombs are in the Andes, in the Colombian Andes, at uh, the top of the mountains, enormous tombs. They, the Baker people established the first, not only you know, copper trade in Michigan, but also the, the, um, First major uh, culture in South America on the Magdalena River. So mm-hmm. there's a lot it, to be done in South America. Okay, J- oh. and Jay, uh, we know from other guests we've had that uh, the Beaker people uh, came from continental Europe. They had um, interactions with the uh, native English people that uh, they kind of worked somewhat together on the building of uh, Stonehenge, or some of the Beaker people were buried at Stonehenge. Uh, but yeah, you, know, you do go on to argue that those you know, the Beaker uh, people are the the people who were uh like the megalithic mariners who were coming to north and mm-hmm. south america uh it, you know were they uh giant people some of them were some of them were some of them are eight feet tall yeah and they, and of course they were huge they were uh, they weren't just tall they were enormous people some of them and they became the elite of most of the civilizations where they landed, including the Hopewell people in the United States. But, Size um, did matter. It, oh yeah, yeah, that's right. And uh, the, um, the, but the, but the, but the confusion on this just goes and goes and goes. The, um, the Smithsonian Magazine just had an article. What the, one of the major magazines just had an article about Stonehenge and claimed it was built by the people before the Beaker people, and the Beaker people came along just afterwards. No, they got it completely wrong. The evidence was wrong. It was in the article, and it was created by the Beaker people, not by their predecessors. It's uh, it's Hmm. amazing that this major article, a major magazine got the whole thing backwards. It's just astonishing. But that's Now, Jay, uh, what's your interpretation of the reason that they built Stonehenge. Was it about navigation? Was it about spiritual stuff? What do you think? Uh, I'm getting it that it's past 8.30. How late does this show go? Does anybody know? Uh, We're about 20 more minutes. Oh, going to 9 o'clock. Okay. Or Um, midnight here. Yeah. 11 o'clock here. Well, thanks for clarifying that a little bit. I... uh, We've done a lot of work on Stonehenge um, uh, many years ago. It's in our first book. Our first book on how the how uh, the Sun God got to America is about the um, petroglyphs in Europe, and the second book on rocks and rows is about the uh, long uh, rows of stones in Karnak and other places in Europe and other sites. And uh, the copper trade is just about uh, the American story, basically. So to answer your question, what, what, what was Stonehenge about? Um, if you look at our, you, 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 you're not going to believe it, but um, um, maybe I'll say it anyhow. You look at our book for the evidence, um, that's how the sun god reached America. Um, the um, Looking at the site mathematically, which is what we do, my partner mm-hmm. at the time was a was PhD in the organ in the physical chemistry and counted everything and so we studied the thing math the site mathematically 
and uh, the you know the first part of it was built at 3000 BC, and then the 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 rest of it was the big stones came in there, you know, a thousand years later. It's kind of a long history of development. Uh, what we think is that when the when the people learned what was on the backside of the earth, it caused an enormous change in uh, thinking, and uh, that that they spent the next thousand years building round stone circles, a thousand stone circles, and they built um, these great big round circles in Costa Rica and around that were teaching sailing. They they just couldn't believe that there was a whole continent uh, full of riches over on the other side of the world. They had no idea what was back there. They had a major effort to find what was on the back side of the earth, and when they did, it was a big deal. And we think that Stonehenge was built to celebrate their discovery of America. But you're not going to be able wow. to believe that until you, until you study it. Celebrate. <laughs> but then there are all those yeah. celestial alignments and all. And it seems That's logical correct. that it would be about but teaching navigation by the stars. They couldn't. They couldn't say have sailed the world without understanding uh, the cross quarter days and so on. So yes, there's uh, all these sites. I just wrote an article in the current Age in America magazine about the site of Kalanish on the Isle of Lewis. And uh, wow. again, again, I could read it mathematically, and it was about a celebration of the sun god and their uh, successful voyage from the America back through their colony in the Azores at uh, 38 degrees north, and um, uh, they built a, a monument to thank the sun god that they reached home after many years of sailing with with uh, all the riches that they came, came back with. It's amazing stories. Hmm. The, the, the heroes, the sailing heroes, and the courage of early man is an, not recognized and not really understood. Uh, the depth of the sailing, the, the talent of these people, and what they accomplished is uh, yeah. a story. What sailors that today could too. accomplish what they did by the stars. Yeah. They, 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 yeah, they had advantages that sailors today don't have. They mm -hmm. they were the seas had not been commercially fished. They were full of food, uh, and the, um, the weather was warmer. We know the weather was warmer during this Bronze Age. Um, there's a number of and their weather, their equipment. Uh, people that want to sail across the Atlantic now, sometimes they just go and get these uh, uh, seal skin clothing and stuff that the old timers had. Their clothing their clothing was good. Their food was excellent. The, Sea was full of food. The climate was warmer. Yeah, they were sailing the seas, and they were very good at it. And they could not record what they, what they, their verbal uh, expressions, their language, but they recorded mm -hmm. their stories digitally, and I'm able to read those now on these bronze axes. It's quite remarkable. Um, supposedly, the latitudes were not known till 500 A.D. Academically, that's what they say, but we can see at the site of uh, Barnanez on the north coast of France that they that they were recording uh, uh, the uh, uh, latitudes at 3800 BC is the date of that monument. So they knew. Yeah. Uh, they were smart. They weren't the, knuckle draggers. They well, they could find their way. They found their way around. They found the other side of the earth. Yeah. It was a very exciting thing. You know, even today. Um, they they uh, record or they uh, honor those early sailors and the whole area, the French Polynesia and those thousands of islands that are out in the middle of the Pacific, just on or, or below the equator, thousands of islands mm -hmm. there. Those people sailed from New Zealand and uh, Australia and the Philippines, and they sailed out knowing the stars and the way the mm -hmm. the light shone through uh what is it um different kinds of crystals and so forth, they could figure out where they were going, and the crystal even today like it, yeah. yeah, and I even today yeah today they memorize they even today that. yeah they used yeah they those, built a, they, they built have, one of those sailboats in Hawaii and sailed it around the world. And yes, and they sailed. 
the double the old technology. Uh, skip mm-hmm. using the old technology, yeah. And they had and no the modern instruments on the ship at all. They just kept on yeah, they, they just kept on using the old ways and they could sail to wherever they wanted to. They knew which stars rose above the horizon at dusk, for example. Yes. They'd, be, they'd have those all memorized. And so they'd be able to tell in the dark which stars had risen and when, you know. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. They were quite skilled. Yes. It, 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 Captain, Cook you... found that this, this, Captain Cook was amazed by the skills of these people. Uh-huh. You know, yeah, because he, he, put he was using instruments. And, he, and then they killed him. He, yeah, some of, them showed, some of them showed Captain Cook where the islands were. <laughs> yep. And yeah, we were, Jules, we we've been speaking of um, you know, the larger AAPS uh, conference, uh, but you and Lee do have um, many conferences at your house for the uh, Ancient Kentucky uh, yeah. group. Uh, t- what uh, do you have uh, coming up? What subjects? I, it's, it seems like you've had a number of uh, King Arthur-related uh, uh, presentations. Uh, can, can you tell us a little bit about those, uh, about, you know, what you have that. going on? At- well, our founder, the founder of the ancient Kentucky, and Kentucky is spelled K-E-N-T-U-C-K-E, Kentucky, mm-hmm. the old-fashioned spelling. Um, the founder um, was very interested in Prince Maddox, M-A-D-D-O-C, uh-huh. and Prince Maddox led him to King Arthur. Now, King Arthur was Prince Maddox's brother. So evidently, Prince Maddox landed and came to Kentucky, and and, and perhaps King Arthur came here, and he might even have been killed here in Kentucky. So we have conferences on things like that, and there are sites in Kentucky up in the hills and in the in the what they call the hills and the hollers <laughs> of areas mm-hmm. which have not been discovered but have ancient buildings on them. And the Ohio River has uh, forts ever so often, like every, what, 20 miles or something, it has forts up and down the Ohio River, which perhaps the Romans have built. And we have someone named Rick Osmond who comes over from Illinois, and he talks about the Roman forts, and he's written several books, I think. The Clan of the mm-hmm. not the Clan, but the Golden... The Graves of the Golden uh, Bear. Grave of the Golden Bear, Yes, and he writes about the Romans who came and went down the Ohio and built their forts. And we have we have all kinds of very interesting artifacts here with lots of Roman coins having been lost in the Ohio River, and people dig them up every once in a while. Um, I know personally of a guy who found a bunch of Roman coins. He dug them up. Um, he Fortunately, another friend took some pictures of them before he took them up to Chicago and sold them. I mean, they just come and go, you know. He knew that they were gold, so he went up and sold them, right? But that there mm-hmm. went an artifact. Yeah, it was did he sell it for melt or for, for historical preservation? Cares about things like that. And, and they just yet melted here it. they are. Yeah, they just they would melt them down. It's really, I mean, this area is rich in um, ancient artifacts, and we are always pleased to have anyone who finds stuff to come and talk to us about it. Last month we had a guy who brought a whole collection of um, stone tools that had been found in, in all kinds of areas by a sheriff. The sheriff was always called to these digs and stuff where they were going to dig up a build, you know, land for a building and stuff, and he would get the artifacts, and cool. this, and he willed them to this <laughs> to this guy, and he brought them and and you know showed us pictures of them. It was right. really 
there's all kinds of stuff like that around here. Oh, so we have a very interesting group. Such a need for a museum that will honor and accept these things. Yeah. Uh, Judy, yeah. or if I, or oh, go go ahead, Jay. Well, if I can help in establishing a museum, um, it'll be the first diff- diffusionist museum in the United States, in the world, actually. In the world. It's much needed. I, I, I was a yeah. son. I thought the Historical Society of Wisconsin, up in um, Madison, was going to be the – I was online to work for free for the next 10 years to build that museum there. And he hired a new archaeologist that said, no way in hell was uh, some of my stuff going to be exhibited. And um, the, the the black stones from a cave, you know, on the Mississippi, he said. I mean, I think that his, guy, his comment was so ignorant that uh, he's a state arch- former state archaeologist. His comment was so ignorant that, that it just uh, appalls me. But I don't think he's ever yeah. seen any artifacts. Um, no one has ever, look. no academic has ever asked to see my artifacts. Um, we have a lot of stuff. I was going to give them millions of dollars worth of stuff, basically. All these uh, decorated axes and all these carved stones. I've got four carvings of the, the, the of Jesus. I mean, let alone uh, Caesar and all and Cleopatra and all the rest of these people. And yet they they consider them all fake. They don't want to see them. They don't. They won't even look at the evidence before they call it fake, which is just astonishing to me. So I am yes. think, I am angry enough to to say that oh, I'm going to start my own dang museum and probably in St. Louis, and uh, and uh, and and exhibit this stuff while I'm still alive. You know, I'm I'm not taking any pills yet. I turn 80 next year, but I think my friends and I are going to try to do this while we're still alive and make this stuff Good. public so that so that we can get this stuff out to and not just have it disappear. Yeah. Right. I think there's some people that want to help help you too, Jay, you know. There is a it's very okay. impo- very important. Uh-huh. Yeah. Jay, why I'm are you Hmm? Why why are you interested in establishing a museum in uh, St. Louis, uh, just halfway because across the country? It's the center of the United States. It's a, one of the world's major airports. It's got if somebody lands there, they can rent a car, they can get the food, they can get a place to stay overnight. It's in a big place, you know, and it's close to. Uh, major discoveries that we're going to be making in southern Illinois, and uh, it's not hard to get there, okay? Now, I'm being asked to go up the river two hours and participate in a museum that's being put together by some uh, Mormons, and they do have a nice thing. They have a a replica of a Phoenician ship that was uh, made from a discovery of a Phoenician ship off of the coast of France, and they sailed the replica from Lebanon to Florida, then chainsawed it up, and then these guys bought it for three hundred seventy thousand bucks, shipped it to this site on the Mississippi, and are rebuilding it right now. Wow! But I can't I can't go there because anybody that would have to go there has got a two hour drive. Uh, to get there, and I, I think it, it, we're going. I think when I get talking with all my friends, that we'll end up putting this thing, if if not I, as close as possible to the airport in St. Louis. That's that's the conclusion um, that I've come to, and I have uh, uh, yeah. support from a number of friends uh, that that is the right thing. That that's the right place to put it. Um, and uh, so, uh, you know, well, there's I think a lot of people. Really... There's hundreds of us who have collections that, you know, and you say yeah. we're getting older. We want a safe, honorable place for them to go. Bob Krepke is helping me with this. He's the former historian for Ford Motor Company, and he um, 
is hand in glove with me on on trying to trying to find get this thing worked out. And okay. um, so so is Wayne May and uh, Peter, I think. So you know, I think we'll be able to put something together. And if people are interested in uh, helping with this, they should contact Wayne May at Ancient American at the mag at the magazine or. Or, or or coming to the conference and meet us. Uh, there's plenty of room for to have people help us. Mm-hmm. Still a lot of work to do. More discoveries to be made, and and learn about those yes. that have been found, and and to get that to more and more people. AAPS is about education, and you too are part of that and contributing so much. I thank you. And thank you, Mark, mm. for giving us a venue to help promote what we do. Oh, I, 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 I've really enjoyed working with you for six years or so. Mm-hmm. Or might be seven. Mm-hmm. It's, um, I, you know, you've introduced us to... Uh, some really interesting people. Uh, Long Krieger has been a guest uh, a couple times. You know, I, I was able to find uh, his. I lost lost the page. Um, but uh, Long's article on the horses uh, you know, gives some nice. Um, uh, drawings of um, pre-contact uh, horses, and that's uh, that. Uh, Lawn's article is followed by uh, Jay's one of Jay's articles, and you know, Lawn, you know, when Lawn's been a guest with us, uh, he's gone into a lot of detail about the. Uh, Michigan Garden Beds. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. in uh, issue number 123 and Axe Head of the Eastern Atlantic Islands by Jay follows that one. So, uh, I, I, I think you, you have so many very, very talented, insightful uh, people not just pres- uh, presenting u- unique looks at what we really don't know about America's pre uh prehistory Mark, pre you're almost contact out of time. Oh, okay uh uh Judy, Mark, uh, can, can you what, the next time uh, you have uh, Lon on people, we're, we're the next time you have Lon on be sure to ask him about his his experiences with UFOs he's got some personal experiences okay uh we'll yeah. uh, we'll, we'll, we'll we'll get into that too and uh if anyone needs uh, more information about the um, uh, oh, conference, AAPS you can go to a- yeah, yeah, aapscopper.com, and well, we have a couple minutes left. Uh, Judy, is there anything else uh, the listeners may need to n- know The lodging is – uh, there it's freezing the and hotel. snowing. We could be beautiful, warm, sunny. We never know what, but be prepared. Bring layers. We have exhibits. We have uh, speaker panels. After each day, the speakers uh, all line up in the tab- uh, table panel, and people can ask questions. And very fun and interesting things happen there. We have a storytelling okay. time on uh, Friday night. A sales room, a silent auction where people donate wonderful things, and uh, enough room so that we can interact and uh, network, and really good meals. Uh, they do okay. terrific. Okay. Uh, all right. Or, or, you, I hate to cut you off. We're almost out of time. I just want to thank uh, Judy, uh, Jill, and Jay, and we'll see everyone next week.